Charles Lucky Luciano was the father of modern organized crime. A pimp, racketeer, and murderer. In 1936, he was sentenced to serve 50 years in jail. That was where he was meant to die. But instead, he spent just 10 years there and died a free man in Italy. Behind this remarkable reversal of fortune is one of the most unlikely collaborations of the Second World War between the US Army and the convicted mobster. For years, the role of the mob in World War II has been hushed up, dismissed as folklore. But this film reveals the startling new evidence that proves beyond any doubt that the US government and the Mafia work together to help win the war. This secret relationship between the United States government and the mob ran from the Battle of the Atlantic the Allied invasion of Italy. In the end, both would get what they wanted. The US would get victory. And Luciano and the Mafia would get power. In 1907, one of America's most unlikely war heroes arrived in New York City. Charles Luciano was an Italian immigrant destined to become a mafia boss of bosses. From the offset, Luciano was different from the other kids. Biographer Tim Newark has spent seven years studying Luciano's life. Luciano wanted more from life. He actually knew he could never settle for that normal life and really from a teenager was involved in all sorts of scams, muggings, thefts. In the slums of New York's Lower East Side, Luciano quickly earned a reputation as a street fighter and petty thief and he began to make some useful contacts. A Polish Jew, Majalanski, was as tough as Luciano himself. Luciano himself later recalled the encounter. I was about a head taller than this midget, but he looked at me without blinking an eye, with nothing but guts showing in his face. Well, I started to laugh. I patted him on the shoulder and said, OK, you got your protection for free. He just pulled away and yelled, shove your protection up your ass. I don't need it. Believe me, I found out he didn't need it. It was the beginning of one of the most lucrative partnerships in New York organized crime. In 1920, U.S. Congress banned the consumption of alcohol and set about getting rid of it. Prohibition began. 
and then backfired. Driven underground, the black market for alcohol fueled an entire underworld of illegal bars, nightclubs, and strip joints. It was just the thing for an ambitious young man looking to make a name for himself. Luciano began to hit the big time. Despite arrests for theft and drug dealing, he ended up controlling 5,000 prostitutes. By 1929, he was suspected of several murders. Luciano was so successful that he caught the eye of one particular organization that was flourishing in the underworld, the Mafia. Luciano was the kind of man to do well in that organization. Like all good mobsters, he wasn't without his charms. For all Luciano's good manners, he rose quickly through the Mafia ranks, even taking out his own boss to get ahead. He waited in a restaurant toilet while he had Joe Massarea executed then stepped out and calmly called the police. By 1932, the Italian immigrant had become mafia boss of bosses. He completely dominated drugs, prostitution, gambling, and protection rackets in New York City. By now, he'd earned himself the nickname Lucky for surviving an attempt on his life. In 1934, the mayor of New York was Flores Lagardia. I have just assumed the office of mayor of the city of New York. He named Luciano public enemy number one. As a true mafia boss, Luciano had the lifestyle to accompany the role. He wore handmade pinstriped suits from London, silk shirts imported from Italy, and for his own protection, lived under an assumed name in a luxury suite in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Then in 1936, Luciano's luck ran out. Despite a warning from his friend and now mob colleague, Majalensky, Luciano couldn't resist the lure of fame. That was Luciano's mistake. He caught the eye of a dangerous opponent, a man with ambition to match his own. We have made a real start on cleaning the gangsters out of New York. In two years, we have shown that our people can be protected, that they can be delivered from the grip of the mob. New York Special Prosecutor Thomas Dewey was determined to rid the city of the mob and to crush its criminals. Racketeer is not and never has been above the law. The real problem is to remove the influence of the racketeer from politics. Dewey had Luciano in his sights. Dewey was waiting for Luciano to slip up, and in 1936, he did. Some of Luciano's girls were persuaded to testify against him. Finally, Dewey had what he needed. Luciano was arrested. On the 11th of May, 1936, the man they called Lucky was led in handcuffs to the State Supreme Court in Manhattan. In a trial lasting four weeks, he was found guilty of extortion and racketeering. 
He was sentenced to 50 years in a New York state prison known to gang members as Little Siberia because of its harsh conditions. His appeals for parole were denied. Luciano seemed to be finished. Locked up and isolated, no amount of bribery or threats could save him. Then came an unlikely opportunity for salvation. World War II. In December 1941, Japan made its surprise attack on the US Navy at Pearl Harbor. The US was plunged into war. The country's huge industrial might was mobilized. Millions of soldiers were conscripted and trained to take the fight to the Japanese on one side and the Nazis on the other. Closer to home, America joined the Battle of the Atlantic. This was the longest campaign of the war. It was the fight to keep Britain supplied. She needed to import over a million tons of goods every week. This was done by convoys of merchant ships crossing the Atlantic in near endless succession. Crucial to all this were the New York docks. 80 square miles of warehouses and piers, the docks were the gateway to the Atlantic and Europe. But from the minute the US entered the war, ships leaving and entering New York came under attack. The US had met a formidable enemy. German U-boats sank around 80 ships a month. Two and a half million tons of shipping were lost in half a year. The United States Navy is today fighting in the greatest war in United States history, and fighting it with all the strength of its guns, planes, ships, and men. The task ahead is tremendous, and is hardly yet begun. Unable to stem the destruction, naval intelligence officers were convinced of one thing. The German spies had infiltrated the docks and were signaling to U-boats offshore. They must be tracked down. The trouble was, the docks were off limits. They were the territory of the Mafia. And they were controlled by men working for the boss of bosses, Lucky Luciano. Even from jail, Luciano retained complete control. The docks were a closed community and almost impossible for US agents to penetrate from the outside. Navy agents' attempts to get information didn't impress them all, as Meyer Lansky recalled in his memoirs. Everyone in New York was laughing at the way those naive Navy agents were going around the docks. They went up to men working in the area and talked out of the corner of their mouths like they'd seen in the movies, asking about spies. The naval intelligence agents were stonewalled. No one in the docks would say anything without Luciano's approval. And Luciano didn't approve. From jail, he'd spotted an opportunity to strike a deal. He knew the US government needed him. They would simply have to be convinced of just how much. Then, on the 9th of February, 1942, something happened that would do exactly that. Moored 
installed at Pier 88 of the New York docks was the Normandy, a luxury French liner. It had been a favorite of film stars and celebrities. The Normandy was both fast and powerful, and when the French capitulated, she was quickly commandeered by the US military, who were transforming her into a troop carrier. Then one afternoon, disaster struck. The Normandy went up in flames. Emergency vehicles rushed to the scene. It was the biggest gathering of emergency services on American soil since the war had begun. For six hours, the Normandy burned. And then, in the early hours of the morning, she keeled over, sunk under the weight of the water that had been pumped onto her decks. The death of a queen. Now the $60 million luxury liner lies on her side, mortally stricken. In the aftermath of the disaster, the investigations began. Was this the work of German saboteurs? Had some of the Italian-American dockers been fascist sympathizers? The FBI had been pursuing spies operating in the States since the 1930s. Their battle against German and fascist agents was well publicized. America was increasingly obsessed with this enemy within. So it was no surprise that these were the prime suspects in the case of the Normandy fire. The event, however, remained shrouded in mystery until Lucky Luciano made a sensational claim. He declared that his men were responsible for torching the Normandy, that it was the work of his henchmen, Albert Anastasia. In a book purported to be based on his direct confessions, Luciano explained. Albert figures that if something could happen to the Normandy, that would make everybody crap in their pants. It was a great idea, so I sent back word to Albert to handle it. A couple of days later, I heard on the radio where the Normandy was on fire and it didn't look like they could save her. That goddamn Albert, he really done a job. Luciano's was not the same as the official version of events. In their investigation of the incident, the US government had come to a different conclusion. The Normandy was an unfortunate accident caused by civilian incompetence. It was decided that the fire had been started by rogue sparks from a workman's blowtorch. The case was supposedly closed. Whatever the truth behind the event, the Normandy disaster would prove to be the beginning of one of the most peculiar relationships of World War II. Whoever had done it, the burning of the Normandy certainly did get the Navy scared. It fueled the fear that their ships were targets for sabotage. Lieutenant Commander Charles Haffenden was head of naval intelligence in New York. His unit's main task was to ensure there were no more incidents like the Normandy. For that, Haffenden knew he had to get access to the docks. And there was only one way to do it. Haffenden launched one of the most secret missions of the war, an operation called Underworld, that would see the United States elite turn to the mob for help. 
Huffington's first port of call was Thomas Dewey. Dewey had spent his career fighting the mobsters, and he knew how to find them. First, he made contact with Joseph Sox Lanza. He was Luciano's man on the ground at the docks, mafia chief of the Fulton Fish Market, where he ran a lucrative business. Every fishing boat in the harbor had to pay dues to Lanza, normally in the shape of a $100 bill. U.S. officials met with Lanza in secret and brokered a deal. Lanza agreed that his fishermen would keep their eyes open around the docks, but he had some unwelcome news. There was no way around it. To get what they needed, U.S. intelligence would have to deal with public enemy number one, who was serving his sixth year in jail, Luciano was reeling them in. He would later claim. As far as Huffington was concerned, he didn't know nothing that was going on, except that he was sitting there with his mouth open, praying I would say yes and help his whole department. The question was who could win them Luciano's trust? There was one contact who might prove helpful. Luciano's old friend, Maya Lansky, was proudly Jewish and hated the Nazis. He had openly opposed the Bund, an anti-Semitic pro-Nazi organization whose rallies mimicked those held in Hitler's Germany. Lansky recalled how, at the secret request of his rabbi, he and his henchmen had raided Bund rallies. The stage was decorated with a swastika and a picture of Hitler. The speaker started ranting. There were only 15 of us, but we went into action. We threw some of them out of the windows. Most of the Nazis panicked and ran out. We chased them and beat them up. We wanted to show them that Jews would not always sit back and accept insults. Maya Lansky was a mobster that a nation at war with the Nazis could do business with. Lansky agreed to see what he could do to help. In May 1942, a strange group of mobsters, lawyers, and intelligence officers headed for the Danamora prison, Little Siberia. With Luciano's blessing, word went out that the mob wanted the dockers to pull together to help the war effort. The Mafia's message was clear. No more ships are to be burned. The order was obeyed completely. By then, Lucky Luciano had been moved from Little Siberia to Great Meadow Prison, one of the easiest going institutions in the US penal system. From the point at which the Mafia pledged their help to the US government, there were no more incidents on the waterfront, and no workers' strikes. The docks ran smoothly for the duration of the war. US Navy intelligence was now committed to working with public enemy number one. But the relationship between the mob and the government didn't end in New York. The war was intensifying. The Allied forces were winning in North Africa. J. 
German Field Marshal Rommel was caught in a trap. British General Montgomery was pushing in from the east. An army commanded by American General Eisenhower was attacking from the west. After tough fighting, the Axis armies of Germany and Italy were pushed out of North Africa. The British Prime Minister Churchill and the US Generals Marshall and Eisenhower decided that an invasion of Europe was now possible. The first stage of this plan would be to attack the island of Sicily. An opportunity was about to come Luciano's way. Lucky Luciano had been born in Sicily. It was also the birthplace of the Mafia. Known as the tradition, the Mafia code of conduct had emerged as a means for Sicilians to protect themselves against foreign exploitation. Sicilians looked to themselves not only for security, but also for justice. If a crime was committed against you, then it was up to you and your family to organize retribution. Luciano had always retained a great love for his home country and had many Mafia contacts there. But in the 1920s, the Sicily mob had acquired a formidable enemy. Fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. Mussolini made his name standing for law and order. He determined to put down strikers, communists, and criminals. So Mussolini sent in his black shirts. He waged war on the Sicilian Mafia, purging towns and villages. From 1927 to 1929, 16 major trials were held and hundreds of Mafia members were imprisoned. By the mid-1930s, the Mafia had been driven underground in Sicily. And Luciano, sitting in Great Meadow Prison, didn't like that situation. He was determined that the Mafia would flourish again in the motherland. Perhaps this would be his chance. And Allied invasion of Sicily was fraught with danger. Through a successful strategy of deception, the Allies had convinced Hitler that the invasion would take place in Greece or Sardinia, not Sicily. But Axis troops stationed in those countries would be quickly redeployed once the true plan was known. The only way to get Allied troops quickly onto Sicily was through amphibious landings. This would leave them vulnerable as they transferred from sea to land. For the invasion to work, the Allies vitally needed intelligence and agents on the ground. Once again, there was only one place for them to turn. Commander Haffenden went once again to his underworld contacts. He wanted information about Sicily from Italian-Americans and recruited Maya Lansky to help. Lansky called in his Sicilian contacts, who would be asked to comment on a large map of the island that Haffenden put in front of them. Some resisted, but not for long. It seems the boss of bosses was once again involved. Luciano had enlisted the help of hardman Joe Adonis, whose role was to encourage people to share information 
as Maya Lansky explains in his memoirs. Sometimes, some of the Sicilians were very nervous. Joe would just mention the name of Lucky Luciano and say he'd given them orders to talk. If the Sicilians were still reluctant, Joe would stop smiling and say, Lucky will not be pleased to hear that you have not been helpful. By July 1943, Haffenden's map was covered in detailed information about Sicily and the waters surrounding the island. As the final preparations for Operation Husky were made, Luciano made an extraordinary bid to take his involvement in the US war effort even further. He asked Maya Lansky to put forward an idea. Lucky came up with a plan that I thought was pretty wild. He wanted to join up with the invading army. He thought his presence would guarantee Sicilian cooperation. He said he was prepared to be parachuted into the island. It's a testimony to the power that Luciano wielded that his request reached the highest levels of the US military before being declined. Why the mobster was being so supportive would only become clear after the war. Armed with intelligence gleaned from the mob, the United States was ready for the invasion. On July the 9th, 1943, Operation Husky began. As the British and Canadians advanced, their progress up the east coast was met by stiff resistance. Every town had to be taken by assault. It looked like it would be a long and hard campaign. In contrast, the American 7th Army under General Patton seemed to have it easy. American Lieutenant Paul Alfieri was in one of the first intelligence teams to arrive at the port of Lakata on the island. On arrival, he was met immediately by an extremely helpful Sicilian. The young man showed Alfieri to the secret hideout of the Italian Naval Command in a beachside holiday villa, and then provided gunmen to help him attack it. Inside the villa were documents providing priceless information, plans of the German and Italian defenses, plus their radio code books. Most importantly, there was information on the Axis naval forces throughout the island. Map overlays detailed marine minefields and revealed safe routes through them. The intelligence saved many Allied lives Lieutenant Alfieri was awarded a Legion of Merit for his actions. It later emerged that the Sicilian who had helped Alfieri was a mafioso who owed Lucky Luciano his life. He'd murdered a New York policeman, and Luciano had saved him from the electric chair by organizing his escape to Sicily. Within two weeks, the US Army had completely secured the western side of the island. Official reports put this down to the efficiency of US troops, as did war photographer Herbert White. Boy, our American warships were crackerjacks. They knocked out every pillbox ashore. 
it was a pretty exhibition of efficiency to see loads of artillery, vehicles, and supplies moving from sea to land like an assembly line in a Detroit factory. But in his memoirs, Myelansky suggested something else was at work. I was told that Mafia and Lucky Luciano were passwords. Maybe that sounds crazy right in the middle of the war. But one of the agents told me later that those words were magic. People smiled, and after that, everything was easy. Luciano himself claimed with characteristic modesty that he had won the war. We may never know just how influential the mob were in the Allied liberation of Sicily. But we do know that Mafia cooperation wouldn't have come without a price. The war had left Sicily in a state of chaos that was now the responsibility of the U.S. Army. AMG entered every captured town in Italy with the first occupying troops. Its job was to transform battlegrounds, step by step, into normal communities. Towns and countryside were full of destitute refugees. To bring the country under control, U.S. officials had little choice but to replace fascist mayors with mafia chiefs. A new mayor was sworn in. This man was now not only responsible to us, but to his own people. Under the guise of being victims of fascism, mafia members, jailed under Mussolini, were released from Italian prisons. Out of the crisis, the Mafia would regain control. This was the beginning of their return to dominance in Sicily. There are some who doubt Luciano's claim that he won the war, and they would be right to. Luciano was, after all, a man who had been found guilty of perjury. But the story of how the US government struck a deal with Lucky Luciano and his criminal associates was deemed worthy of investigation in 1954. It was this that produced the official Herland's report. The report clearly states that the burning of the Normandy was a pivotal point in US domestic naval strategy. Although it stopped short of drawing a direct link with the Mafia. It also clearly states that US naval intelligence had no doubts about the morality of dealing with known criminals. America was, after all, fighting for her life. The exploitation of informants, irrespective of their backgrounds, is not only desirous, but necessary when the nation is struggling for its existence. Intelligence, as such, is to prevent and must encompass any and all means. By any and all means, I include the so-called underworld. And concerning the invasion of Sicily, the report states that... Numerous Italians of Sicilian birth were enlisted to provide information about the terrain, harbors, etc. of Sicily in anticipation of the Allied invasion. Through these informants, the names of friendly Sicilian natives and even mafia personalities were obtained and used in the Sicilian campaign.
Official documentation barely alludes to any deal that had been struck with Luciano. But the events that followed the war speak for themselves. In 1946, the convicted pimp, racketeer, and murderer, Lucky Luciano, was freed from prison. He'd served just 10 of his 50-year sentence. The only condition of his freedom was that he left the United States. So on February the 9th, 1946, Luciano boarded a ship in New York. Majalansky and Frank Costello were there to see him off. Luciano quickly re-established himself. Operating first from Cuba, and then Italy. Soon, lucky Luciano was back in business. With Sicily now back under mob control, he massively strengthened his criminal links across the Atlantic and expanded the influence of the New York Mafia. In 1962, aged 64, Luciano died, a free man and a criminal legend. This remarkable reversal of fortune seems proof enough that Luciano truly had contributed to the US war effort.